Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Podmashinsky. Lecture 8. Meaning of Revolution. Now, in order to get a full picture of the meaning of the revolution of our times, we will look at a number of thinkers in the 19th century who were called reactionaries, people who were against the revolution. Because by seeing arguments that were brought against the revolution, and by seeing how a number of them themselves were influenced by deeper ideas which revolutionaries shared, we will get a deeper understanding of how deep this revolution goes. The new order in Europe in 1815, after Napoleon was overthrown, was the reaction, the Holy Alliance, that is, the monarchs of Europe who were restored, and there was a definite reaction. Revolutionary movements were discouraged and even squashed, Russia took a leading part in this. Even Tsar Alexander, who was under a very Masonic influence in his early years. Later on, after this time, after this Congress in Vienna, he began to understand that revolution was a serious business and that Christianity was quite other than he pictured it. And especially under the influence of the Archimandrite Photius, who persuaded him that the Masons were out to destroy his kingdom, and warned him against all these Protestants who were filtering in, and the Bible Society. And when there was a rebellion in Spain in 1820, he volunteered to send a hundred thousand cassocks to squash it. And the other powers of Europe decided this was too risky that they'd better let the French take care of it. And so the French did take care of it, and squashed the rebellion. But from that time on, the Russian Tsars became very aware of their responsibility to fight the revolution, especially inside Russia, and, where possible, outside Russia. With one exception, that is, when the Greek rebellion broke out against the Turks, the Russians supported it. And later on in 27 through 28, 1927 through 28, when the Turks threatened to take over the Greek kingdom again, Tsar Nicholas, the arch-conservative, came to the aid of the Greeks, even though Metternich, the great statesman, warned him that they were also Masons and rebels just like the rest of them. And he said, but anyway, they're orthodox, and we come to the aid of the orthodox kingdoms. And owing to a great deal to the Russian czars, Greece has a kingdom today as an independent state. They're not under the Turks. Metternich The leading statesman of this time in the west of Europe was Metternich. M-E-T-T-E-R-N-I-C-H the foreign minister of Austria, who was the spokesman for the conservative movement. Although he himself was not quite as reactionary as he's painted to be. There's a brief description of his basic philosophy here in these books on the post-revolutionary epoch. He also was born in the 70s, 1773, and died in 1859 the offspring of a Catholic noble family in the Rhineland. He witnessed as a youth the Jacobin excesses, that is, revolutionary excesses, at Strasbourg which confirmed his contempt for mob democracies and his faith in European society founded on Latin civilization, consecrated by Christian faith and embellished by time. He grew up with a deep reverence for tradition. The old regime, in its last days, produced in him its ablest, if not its noblest, representative. He was a fine flower of an age that is now only a memory. 
a polished and courtly aristocrat, cool, urbane, and imperturbable, a patron of the arts, a diplomat of first rank, a lover of beauty, order, and tradition, something of a cynic, perhaps, but always polite and charming. He entered the Austrian diplomatic service and made his reputation by worsting Napoleon in the critical days of 1813 after the retreat from Moscow. After the emperor's fall, he reigned as prime minister of Europe until the revolution of 1848 overthrew him. He saw that he was living in an age of transition. The old order, which had seemed so firm and secure, was everywhere dissolving, and none could divine what was to take its place. Before a new equilibrium was attained, a period of anarchy and chaos must intervene. Metternich's life work was to stave off collapse as long as possible, and maintain stability for the time, at whatever cost. He was fully alive to the impermanent character of his achievements, remarking bitterly that he spent his days in propping up worm-eaten institutions that he should have been born in 1700 or 1900 for he never fitted into the revolutionary Europe of the 19th century. The future, he knew, was with democracy and nationalism, and all that he held sacred, monarchy, church, aristocracy, tradition, was doomed. But it was his duty to move on, to retreat if need be, to the very last line of defense before giving up. So that's this statesman, who wrote his memoirs also, a very conservative man. He was against what he called the presumptuous men, these revolutionaries who were constantly rising up with their egotistic theories that they were going to remake society. He was overthrown in 1848 in the new wave of revolution which had swept over the whole of Europe. Another one of the chief, there are actually three chief conservative philosophers at this time, thinkers, one in England, one in France, one in Spain. In England, the conservative is Edmund Burke, who was one of the first ones to protest against the revolution already in 1790, when he wrote these reflections on the revolution in France. In this book, Reflections on the Revolution, he says, Is it in destroying and pulling down that skill is displayed? Your mob, that is, revolutionaries, can do this as well at least, as your assemblies. The shallowest understanding, the rudest hand, is more than equal to that task. Rage and frenzy will pull down more in half an hour than prudence, deliberation, and foresight can build up in a hundred years. At once to preserve and to reform is quite a different thing. A spirit of innovation is generally the result of a selfish temper and confined views. People will not look forward to posterity, who never look backward to their ancestors. By a constitutional policy working after the pattern of nature, that is, we English, we transmit our government and our privileges in the same manner in which we enjoy and transmit our property and our lives. The institutions of policy, the goods of fortune, the gifts of providence are handed down to us, and from us in the same course and order. Our political system is placed in a just correspondence and symmetry with the order of the world, wherein by the disposition of a stupendous wisdom, 
molding together the great mysterious incorporation of the human race. The whole, at one time, is never old or middle-aged or young, but, in a condition of unchangeable constancy, moves on through the varied tenor of perpetual decay, fall, renovation, and progression. Thus, by preserving the method of nature in the conduct of the state in what we improve, we are never wholly new in what we retain, we are never wholly obsolete. A disposition to preserve and an ability to improve, taken together, will be my standard of a statesman. Of course, these are very sensible words, spoken against people who talk about novelty for the sake of novelty, and show that they don't know how to bring it about. And when they do bring it about, they really upset the whole society. But of course, he was an Englishman. What his idea of conservatism is, is preserving whatever we have. And whatever we have is the English monarchy, with the developing already idea of democracy. At that time, it was still quite conservative. Only the aristocrats had the right to vote, the upper classes, and the parliament was not at all representative of the whole people. It was gradually evolving in that direction, however. And, of course, he was undoubtedly an Anglican, and already that's a falling away even from Catholicism. Catholicism's falling away from orthodoxy, and you can evolve a new religion of Anglicanism. It means, even though he's very conservative, that there's no underlying principle which he can rely on, and it's only a matter of time until, as we shall see, this kind of conservatism can evolve into something which is quite democratic and already utopian. And so, this kind of conservatism will not go very far. Donoso Cortez But there's a second thinker of this time a little bit later. Born 1809, died in 1853, who lived in Spain. His name is Juan Donoso Cortez. I think he was a prince or a count or something. He is not too well known in the West, although one of his books has been translated into English. And he is the most philosophical of all the people in the West who wrote about against the revolution. He wrote his great book in 1852 called Essays on Catholicism, Liberalism, and Socialism. He's a Marquis, Marquis of Val de Gamas. And he is most significant because he clearly saw that this revolution is not some kind of an aimless thing. It has definite purpose behind it. And he even said that the revolution is theological. In order to defeat it, you must have a different theology. He was especially against the great anarchist of his time, Proudhon, whom we shall talk about in the next lecture. Proudhon, we'll see, is quite profound, more profound than many other revolutionaries, and he, Cortez, quotes even Proudhon at the very opening of this book. He says, it's called How a Great Question of Theology is Always Involved in Every Great Political Question. In his Confessions of a Revolutionist, Monsieur Proudhon has written these remarkable words. It is wonderful how we ever stumble on theology in all our political questions. There is nothing here to cause surprise except the surprise of Monsieur Proudhon. Theology, inasmuch as it is the science of God, is the ocean which contains and embraces all sciences, 
as God is the ocean which contains and embraces all things. And this whole book is an exposure of liberalism. First, of mainly socialism as being anti-God. And liberalism he doesn't even have much respect for at all, because he sees it's only a halfway between socialism and monarchy. And there is one book here he quotes, somehow, excerpts from this book, uh, Vierich. As Metternich called these revolutionaries the presumptuous men, Donoso Cortez called them the self-worshipping men. And he liked them better than the liberals, because they had their own dogmas at least. You can fight against them on dogmatic grounds. He saw that the ending of religious influence on politics, that is, the atheist revolution, would produce in the future the most gigantic and destructive despotism ever known. In fact, in one of his talks before the Parliament in Spain, 1852, he told them that the end of the revolution is Antichrist. We can see on the horizon in the next century. In that respect, he's quite profound. Here he gives some general quotes on the liberals and socialists. The liberal school, he said, is placed between two seas, whose constantly advancing waves will finally overwhelm it, between socialism and Catholicism. It cannot admit the constituent sovereignty of the people without becoming democratic, socialistic, and atheistic, nor admit the actual sovereignty of God without becoming monarchical and Catholic. This school is only dominant when society is threatened with dissolution, and the moment of its authority is that transitory and fugitive one, in which the world stands doubting between Barabbas and Jesus, and hesitates between a dogmatical affirmation and a supreme negation. At such a time, society willingly allows itself to be governed by a school which never affirms nor denies, but is always making distinctions. Such periods of agonizing doubt can never last any great length of time. Man was born to act, and will resolutely declare either for Barabbas or Jesus, and overturn all that the sophists have attempted to establish, the socialist schools, whom we may always think of as Marx, Proudhon, Saint Simon, Owen, Fourier, and all those thinkers possess great advantages over the liberal school, precisely because they approach, to state, directly all great problems and questions, and always give a preemptory and decisive solution. The strength of socialism consists in its being a system of theology, and it is destructive only because it is a satanic theology. The socialist schools, as they are theological, will prevail over the liberal because the latter is anti-theological and skeptical, but they themselves, on account of their satanic element, will be vanquished by the Catholic school, which is at the same time theological and divine. The instincts of socialism would seem to agree with our affirmations, since it hates Catholicism while it only despises liberalism. And its history seems to prove him true, because indeed communism takes over the world and democracy becomes more and more radical and more and more utopian in order to compete with socialism. Again, he says, The Catholics affirm that evil comes from man, and redemption from God. 
the socialists affirm that evil comes from society and redemption from man. The two affirmations of Catholicism are sensible and natural, namely, that man is man and performs human works, and that God is God and performs divine acts. The two affirmations of socialism assert that man understands and executes the designs of God, and that society performs the works proper to man. What, then, does human reason gain when it rejects Catholicism for socialism? Does it not refuse to receive that which is evident and mysterious, in order to accept that which is at once mysterious and absurd? Now his reasoning is quite straight. He had a few thoughts on Russia also. He saw that he believed that Russia, he was very afraid of the Russian peril. He thought that Russia was going to overwhelm the West. And after overwhelming the West, it would drink the poison of the revolution itself and die just like Europe. De Maestra. We'll see what the next thinker thinks about Russia. This next one, who is probably the best known of the radical conservatives, the real reactionaries, is Joseph de Maistre, who was actually not a Frenchman but a Sardinian, although he spoke French. It's a French-speaking kingdom. In fact, he was an ambassador from Sardinia to St. Petersburg during the time of Napoleon and after Napoleon. He was born in 1753 and died in 1821. He is the apologist for the divine right of kings in the 18th century tradition. In fact, he even got somewhat embarrassed because his book on the divine right of kings was published without his knowledge. He wrote it several years earlier, and it was published just at the time when the restored Bourbon king, Louis XVIII, accepted the constitution. And therefore, this king thought he was against him. And of course, he accepted and compromised finally, but he did set forth the principle of divine right. The aim of his philosophy and of conservative philosophy, according to him, is absolutely to kill the whole spirit of the 18th century. You see, he's quite bold. No compromise with Voltaire, Rousseau, the revolution, nothing. The answer to the revolution, he says, is the Pope and the executioner. Quote, Virek, page 29 through 32. In fact, he has a whole page in one of his books in which he praises the man, the executioner with the axe in his hand, who comes home at night to his wife with a clean conscience because he has done the duty of society. He is actually quite, himself, rationalistic. It's just that he starts in a different place. He starts with absolute Catholicism. And he's rather a cold thinker, but very astute, very clear thinking. He can see that these other rationalists, or atheist rationalists, begin without God, and therefore they end in absurdity. He wrote one book on God in society, and it came out during Napoleon's time. And there's a few excerpts here that we'll quote from him. One of the gravest errors of a century which embraced them all. See how immediately he leaps on the 18th century was to believe that a political constitution could be written and created a priori, whereas reason and experience agree that a constitution is a divine work, and that it is precisely the most fundamental and most essentially constitutional elements in the nation's laws that cannot be written. This quote is very profound because obviously these countries of Europe had an orderly government, their own traditions. 
An absolute monarch is, of course, not absolute, because he is always hedged about, first of all by the church, then by his nobles, then by what the people want. And no absolute monarch was ever just some kind of absolute despot, except for the revolutionary despots, who have no kind of tradition to stop them. And of course, the Constitution is not a piece of paper. It's something which comes out of the experience of a whole nation, based largely on religion. Again, he says, Everything, therefore, brings us back to the general rule. Man cannot make a constitution, and no legitimate constitution can be written. The corpus of fundamental laws that constitute a civil or religious society have never been written and never will be written. This can only be done when a society is already constituted, yet it is impossible to spell out or explain in writing certain individual articles. But almost always these declarations are the effect or the cause of very great evils, and always cost the people more than what they are worth. From that point of view, he's quite wise. These people, who think they're all of a sudden going to put down a whole new government on paper, always end up by creating despotism, having to revise the Constitution, finally abolishing the Constitution, and establishing some kind of new monarch like Napoleon. But we see in this de Maistre, who was the most fanatical anti-revolutionary, we see a very interesting thing. Because he was so very anti-revolutionary and at the same time was very rational, he came to new conclusions which were not in the European philosophy of the past. He saw that revolution was a very strong movement, and you had to have something very strong to oppose it. And therefore, he became the apologist for the Pope. And in fact, he said, Without the Pope, sovereign pontiff, there is no real Christianity. In fact, he said, the Pope in himself is Christianity, as if the Pope in himself entirely represents Christianity. So his position of being an anti-traditional, being menaced with the revolution, leads him to a new kind of rationalist absolutism, the absolutism of the Pope. In fact, he was one of the chief people whose ideas related to lead to the doctrine of papal infallibility, proclaimed in 1870, which is something new. The Catholics didn't have it before. They say it developed out of the past. It was only then against the revolution that they had to proclaim something new, that is, the Pope himself is the one outward standard you can see, which will protect you from the revolution. It is quite a long book. I have the French edition of the book on the Pope by de Maistre. He talks about all kinds. The Russian church also is here. And we'll see what he said about the Russian church here. But this is one of the leading textbooks of ultramontanism, so-called, that is, the absolute infallibility of the Pope. But it's something new, even in Catholic tradition, as an outward, absolutely external, and clear standard which you can oppose to revolution, because he saw the tradition is dying off, the Catholic tradition's dying off, and you have to have some kind of an absolute monarch to save it and it's very logical. We'll see later on what Dostoevsky has to say about this. This book of his, On the Pope, was conceived as an answer to another book which was printed at that time, 1816, by the Russian minister Sturdza, S-T-U-R-D-Z-A, in which he printed in French, declaring to the great Chagrin of de Maistre, that the Roman Church was schismatic, and only the Orthodox Church was the true Church of Christ. 
And he was so upset by this because for him Catholicism is the one thing which is against revolution. And these Russians, this barbarous country, dares to say that they are the one church? In fact, he described Russia as a country constantly lying in laziness, which only wakes up, stirs once in a while, in order to throw out some kind of blasphemy against the Pope. He felt that the Western peoples, in fact, he accused the Russians of having missed the whole development of Western civilization, and he does not see that that whole development is what led to the revolution, because he puts it back only to the Renaissance. The Middle Ages is fine, that's the very peak as far as he's concerned. And he says the one big thing missing in Russia is the idea of universalism, which is represented by the Pope. We'll see what Dostoevsky says, a very profound thing, about this universalism. Tsar Nicholas I. Now we have a different kind of thing, because now we discuss the question of the traditionalism, anti-revolutionism, in Russia. We'll start first with Nicholas I, and later on have some more general comments on this anti-revolutionary tradition in Russia. As I said in the first lecture, Nicholas I was an exemplary monarch in the pure tradition of Russian absolutism. There is no constitution, no parliament. The king reigns supreme. Tsar reigns supreme. He was familiar with the revolution. He went to see Owen, his experiment. He was very interested in making better the lot of the people. In this time, the Industrial Revolution was even slightly coming to Russia, but much more in the West. And he studied the revolution carefully and studied the doings of Louis XVI and already had a quite conscious view of what he was going to do. We will quote some of these statements here from this book by Nicholas Talberg, who was a late professor in Jordanville. And as we now come to Russia, we'll see something different because these Western thinkers, they're all in the Catholic tradition or even Anglican tradition, and they're very clear thinkers. They see through the revolution pretty well, but they're still participating in this Western atmosphere which is rather rationalistic, and they're lacking some kind of deeper rootedness in tradition. And these people, even this person, Talberg, who died just some years ago, you can see by what he writes that he himself is deeply rooted in Orthodox tradition, and therefore his conclusions are not just conclusions of somebody who has thought things through, but are conclusions of somebody who feels what is the tradition of religion, orthodox religion, and the tradition of the political tradition also. Most of what he says will come from quotes of contemporaries of Nicholas I, who, when he's writing, also you can see that he's very deeply conservative, not just in mind, but in his whole life. His whole heart is that way. And there are many Russians like this left. For Emperor Nicholas I, he writes, in the very first hours of his reign, there began his ardor, striving, to manfully hold up Russia against those frightful misfortunes which were threatening it by the criminal light-mindedness of the so-called Decembrists. This enthusiasm, struggling, of the Tsar ended some thirty years later, when he defended the fatherland, this time from external enemies who hated Russia, in the Crimean War when he died. He was above all a man of principle and duty. Emperor Nicholas was entirely penetrated with the consciousness of duty. During the time of the war for the fatherland, that is, Napoleon's invasion, when he was 16 years old, he was terribly anxious to go to the army. I was ashamed, he said, to see myself useless, a useless creature on the earth, 
not even fit to be able to die a brave death. Six years before he ascended the throne, he was terribly distressed to the point of tears when Emperor Alexander, his older brother, told him of his intention to leave the throne which he would hand over to Nicholas. Although there was one brother older than Nicholas, Constantine, as a consequence of the fact that Tsarevich Constantine did not wish to reign. Nicholas, Pavlovich wrote in his diary later, the emperor, This conversation finished, but my wife and I were left in the situation which may be likened to the feeling which must strike a man who is going peacefully along a pleasant road, which is sown everywhere with flowers, and from which one sees everywhere the most pleasant views, when all of a sudden an abyss opens up before his feet towards which an unconquerable power is pushing him without allowing him to step aside or to turn back. This is the way he felt from the very beginning, that he was going to be Tsar. And he felt this was a terrible burden. He did not want to be the Tsar. You see the difference already. Revolutionaries struggled just to beat everybody else off so they can be the head. And here this government which is based upon hereditary authority, the person who does not want the kingdom gets it, and he has to rule. But we see already there's a much better possibility for a just rule under such conditions. His kingdom, his reign, began with the rebellion of the Decembrists, who were infected by the revolutionary ideas. This is the way he spoke to the senior officers of the guard, gathered by him on the morning of December 14th, when the rebellion had become known already. And he said to them, I am peaceful since my conscience is clear. You know, sirs, that I did not seek the crown. I do find that I have neither the experience nor the needful talents to bear such a heavy burden. But since the Lord entrusted this to me, and as it is likewise the will of my brothers, and the fundamental laws of the land, therefore I shall dare to defend it, and no one in the world will be able to wrest it away from me. I know my obligations, and I shall be able to fulfill them. The Russian emperor in case of misfortune must die with his sword in his hands. But in any case, without foreseeing by what means we will be able to come out of this crisis, I will in that case entrust my son to you. During this rebellion of the Decembrists, which was not a bloody thing like what happened in France, just a number of officers who began to demand a constitution and was easily dispersed because of the boldness of the Tsar. He went right out in the midst of them at the head of his troops. I believe the five ring leaders were hanged, and the rest were sent into exile. And when he was asked about having mercy on them, he said, The law dictates punishment for them, and I will not make use of the right of mercy that belongs to me regarding them. I will be unwavering. I am obliged to give this lesson to Russia and to Europe. Studying history in his youth, he was especially interested in the French Revolution. At that time, he said, King Louis XVI did not understand his obligations, and for this he was punished. To be merciful does not mean to be weak. The sovereign does not have the right to forgive the enemies of the government. And in 1825, these enemies were the Decembrists, and so the emperor subjected them to punishment. But at the same time, he kept a strictness. The sovereign revealed also great concern with regard to these rebels, which was bound up with the general laws concerning prisoners. We'll see now what a contrast is here between this and not only revolutionaries who simply kill people off without mercy, but even the liberals. 
In his own handwriting, the emperor gave to the commandment of the Peter Paul Fortress prison the following words. The prisoner Ryeliev should be placed in the Alexevsky prison, but his hands should not be bound. He should be given paper for writing, and whatever he will write to me in his own hands is to be given to me every day. The prison Karhovsky is to be kept better than ordinary prisoners. He's to be given tea and everything else that he wants. I will undertake the keeping of Karhovsky on my own income. Since Batenkov is sick and wounded, his condition is to be made as easy as possible. Sergei Murevyev is to be kept under strict arrest according to your judgment. He is wounded and weak. He is to be given everything he needs. There is to be every day a doctor's examination of him, and his wounds are to be rebound. Then all the arrested and prisoners were ordered by the Tsar to be given a better type of food, tobacco, books of religious content, and a priest was to be allowed to come to them for spiritual conversation. They were not to be forbidden to write to their relatives, of course, only through the commandment, that is, he would read the letters. On 19th of December, the sovereign sent the wife of one of these revolutionaries, Ryelyev, 2,000 rubles and a reassuring letter from her husband. She wrote to Ryelyev, that is, her husband, My friend, I do not know with what feelings or words to express the unutterable mercy of our monarch. After the guilty ones were condemned, in a year, he made their condition even easier. The chief means of his mercy was through secret decrees. The fulfilling of them he entrusted to his authorized agent, General Laparsky. Go with the commandment to Nurchinsk, Serbia, and ease the lot of the unfortunate ones there, he told him. I give you full authority in this. I know that you will be able to harmonize the duty of service, that is, the fact that they're prisoners, with Christian compassion. Leparsky fulfilled exactly the directions of the sovereign, and by this earned the love of the Decembrists and their wives. And all the good things which he did for the prisoners and their wives, they thought were owing to his own good heart, without understanding that he was only doing with great joy what had been commanded him by the sovereign. We see here a spirit of Christian compassion, which is totally foreign to communism, to socialism, to liberalism, and to even these ordinary monarchs in the West. There were a few incidents in the life of Tsar Nicholas which reveal a different attitude to the whole process of governing, and the attitude of the king toward his subjects. There was in 1849, during the month of May, a parade in which 60,000 troops took part. Many spectators were present. When at the time of the ceremonial march, of course, the Tsar is standing there ready to salute the soldiers, the second battalion of the Yagursky Legion, in which Lvov was the leader, the sovereign with his inimitable voice, which was quite loud, commanded, Parade, stop! The whole regiment stopped dead in their tracks. The sovereign with a sign of his hand stopped the music and called Lvov, the leader, out of the ranks. In the hearing of all, he turned to him and said, Lvov, by an unfortunate mistake, you have unjustly and completely innocently suffered, because earlier he had accused him of taking part in this very conspiracy that Dostoevsky was caught in. These people studying the writings of Fourier and talking about the overthrow of the government. And he was mistaken for somebody else by the sovereign. And here, before 60,000 troops and many thousands of spectators, he apologizes. 
I beg forgiveness of you before the soldiers and the people. For the sake of God, forget all that has happened to you and embrace me. With these words bending down from his horse, the sovereign three times kissed Lvov strongly. Having kissed the hand of the emperor, Lvov was thus made so happy, returned to his place. At the command of the sovereign, the march began again. This moment, says an eyewitness, for those who saw it and heard the voice of their sovereign, the feelings that filled their heart at that time cannot be called ecstasy. This was something beyond ecstasy. The blood stopped in one's veins. To see the sovereign of all Russia stop and ask forgiveness of a simple officer. But we see on another occasion what happened. There was a certain woman whose husband was imprisoned, also in a revolutionary affair of some kind. And she stopped him someplace where he was looking at various institutions, and he allowed her to come and present a petition to him, and he began to read it. There was here a request to have mercy upon her husband, who had taken an active part in the Polish rebellion, which had occurred recently, and for this had been sent to Siberia. And by the way, they were sent to Siberia under very easy conditions. They had their own houses, were well fed, and everything else. The sovereign listened heedfully, and the woman sobbed. Having read the petition, the sovereign returned it to the petitioner and sharply declared, Neither the forgiveness nor even a lightening of the punishment of your husband can I give. And he cried out to the chauffeur to go further. When he returned, the sovereign withdrew into his office. Immediately after his return, there was a need for this one officer, Bibikov, to go to the Tsar with a report. There was a double door into this office. Having opened the first door, and intending to go into the second, Bibikov stepped back in indescribable astonishment. In the small corridor between the two doors, the sovereign was standing and was all shaking from stifled sobs coming out of him. Great tears were coming out of his eyes. What is wrong with you, your majesty? Bibikov mumbled. Oh, Bibikov, he said, if only you knew how difficult, how terrible it is to be unable to forgive. I cannot forgive now this man. That would be weakness. But after some time, make another report to me about him. We see here the combination of absolute strictness because he knows that weakness leads to overthrow of government. And that's exactly what the revolutionaries are feeding upon. This liberalism which creeps into their governments and allows them to constantly say, well, we really believe the same thing as you, almost. We are working for the same end, and we'll forgive you, and everything will be fine. And instead he was very strict, at the same time very merciful. And when the conditions were such that this weakness would not cause a temptation to people to say that he's soft on the revolutionaries, and therefore the revolutionaries can develop themselves, then he's extremely kind. And you can see his heart is filled with compassion for them, but his sense of duty would not allow him to do what would be for the harm of the whole people. His attitude towards his whole people is not like in the West, where they let the representatives have an entirely cold relation to the subjects, to the citizens, or even the Western kings who are obviously governing people of all kinds of different beliefs, and there's no kind of particular warmth. In some Western states there still was, and the monarchies perhaps. This is rapidly being lost. But the reign of Nicholas I, quote, was something quite like a family, very patriarchal. And from him there was something paternal 
in his relationship towards his subjects, being very severe and threatening towards the enemies of the kingdom. He was at the same time merciful and filled with love for his good and faithful subjects. In his addresses to the people and his soldiers, he would often address them as my children. Once he was traveling, he wanted to have a special word to say to certain troops. He came to the tents where they were and he commanded, my troops, my children, come to me. Everyone just as he is dressed. This order was fulfilled precisely, some in their dress uniforms, some in overcoats, and some just in their underwear. And many of them lined up around the sovereign and the Tsarevich. And where is Conan Zabuga? the Tsar asked. This was a non-commissioned officer who had recently distinguished himself. Here I am, your imperial majesty resounded over the head of the sovereign the loud voice of Zaboga, who, dressed in only his underwear, had climbed a tree to see the Tsar better. The sovereign ordered him to climb down, and when he almost fell head over heels to the ground and stood up in the front, the emperor kissed him on the head and said, Give this to all your companions for their brave service. The captain of the general headquarters, Philipson, who was an eyewitness of this, said, This whole scene, so sincere and unprepared, produced upon the troops a much deeper impression than any kind of eloquent speech would have. Of course, under the old-fashioned system, this was possible that there's such a humane relationship between the king and his subjects. Of course, the main thing about his spiritual makeup was his orthodox faith. Here he describes in his diary, the Tsar's own diary, what he did on the 14th of December when he was faced with the rebellion of the Decemberists. Being left alone, I asked myself what to do and crossing myself, I gave myself over to the hands of God, and decided to go myself wherever the danger threatened greatest. And he admitted later that at this time besides this decision, he had no definite plan of action, but to trust in God. Another time he was traveling and fell down off his horse and broke his shoulder and was left with only one of his orderlies. And this is what he said to the orderly. I feel that I've broken my shoulder. This is good. This means God is waking me up. That one does not need to make any kind of plans without asking his help first. For a king to be thinking like this, of course, shows that he places, he is absolute ruler, theoretically, but above him is God. Concerning his heir, Alexander, who became Alexander II, he says, We were speaking also about Shasha, Alexander, and we both thought that he was showing great weakness in his character, and was allowing himself to be easily given over to distractions. I am hoping all the time that this will pass as he grows up, so that... Because the foundations of his character are so good, one can expect a great deal. But without this strength of character, he will fall, for his work, as emperor, will be no lighter than mine. And what is it that saves me? Of course, not my talents. I am a simple man, but my hope in God and my firm will to act. That is all that I have. And when he was celebrating the 25th anniversary of his reign, and when people were surrounding him and giving him glory, his daughter went up to him and said, Aren't you happy now, Papa? Aren't you satisfied with yourself? And he said, With myself? And pointing his hand to heaven, he said, 
I am just a splinter of wood. That is, this very thing that we Americans have so strong, satisfaction with ourselves, the Tsar himself did not even have it. He is so aware that he is serving something else. I have here the comments of a certain Spanish writer in the 1850s writing about Tsar Nicholas, a certain Vittel. In general, he says, the Eastern question, which the Western diplomats were so occupied with then, the question of Turkey, it is not strange that this question cannot be solved by those who so often allow themselves to be blinded by the disorderly theories of our so-called government representatives. But if we look with some heedfulness and dispassion at the character of Russian diplomacy, we will immediately see the enormous contrast which has always been presented. On the one hand, by the ability of the Moscow government, and on the other hand, by the paradoxes of our own government people. Quote, Intrigues and money are the agents which, more than anything else, affect our own governments. And we know at that time that all the English, French, everybody was so filled with sending agents, and being bought up and everything else, thinking only about their narrow national interests, and breaking treaties as though they're nothing. Yet if there is a chance to get away with it. Because we everywhere and always see such complete non-entities, with a few exceptions, and the higher places of administration, at the head of the armies, at the governance of the diplomatic corps, and even in the professorships of our universities. The Russian government does not follow this very poor example. They use in their service all the best people, without paying attention to, special, their political opinions, their origins, and so forth. In a word, the Russian government has always followed in this case the most liberal politics which our representatives do not know anything about. After having fought against Islam for so many centuries, Christian Europe goes to it for assistance and has taken it under its protection when it was ready to fall apart, and, under the pretext of placing a barrier to despotism, it is sharpening its sword for the defense of another despotism. This refers, of course, to the fact that, considering the Tsar is in this great peril, that they're only trying to expand. The Western powers are constantly supporting Turkey, and it even happened that, during the Crimean War, the Tsar was kind. He did it only for the sake of the Orthodox peoples of the Balkans and Greece. And he knew that the English and French would take the side of the Turks, just to oppose him. And he was counting on his, I think it was his cousin, the Emperor of Austria and of Germany. And they guaranteed that they would be on his side. But they found that it would be diplomatically better to be on the other side, because the balance was better that way. And therefore they broke their promises. And he wrote to the Emperor of Austria and he said, don't tell me that you too are going to fight under the sign of the Turkish Crescent. It's enough for this barbarian English and French to do it, but you, my own cousin, you're supposed to be standing for monarchy. And that hurt him very much when someone had given him a promise, his fellow monarch had given a promise, and would not keep it for the sake of politics and he always was faithful to his promises. This Spanish writer continues, A spirit of prejudice forces our journalists to speak about the Emperor Nicholas as of some despot, and one in love with his own honor, who by his personal caprices and his unrestrained pride is supposedly bringing the blood of his own people as a sacrifice 
and also is sacrificing the balance of power in Europe and the good state of the whole world. But in actual fact, there are not today many such sovereigns who are really worthy of praise, both for their gifts as their personal and public virtues. Emperor Nicholas was a devoted man, a gentle and caring father, a faithful friend and monarch, who with all his power was concerned for the happiness of his subjects. All his daughters and grandchildren lived in his court, with the exception of the Grand Duchess Olga. The people blessed his name, and one must acknowledge that the whole of Europe is obliged to him for the preservation of the order, which is now being threatened by the senselessness and arrogance of this fierce Emperor Napoleon III. This is interesting as a testament from outside of Russia. Of course, inside of Russia, he was greatly loved by all except the revolutionaries. Now let us examine how such a one as this dies. I have a full account of his last days. The doctor who attended him said the following, From the time when I began my medical practice, I have never seen a death anything like this death. I did not even consider it possible that the consciousness of precisely fulfilled duty joined with an unwavering firmness of will, should to such an extent be dominant even at the fatal moment when the soul is freed from its earthly shell, so as to go to eternal repose and happiness. I repeat, I would have considered this impossible if I had not had the misfortune to live to see all this man die. The Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna offered to the Tsar, as he was dying, that he should receive Holy Communion. He was disturbed that he should not have to receive the Holy Gifts lying down and not fully clothed. His confessor, the Proto-Presbyter Vasily Vazhanov, said that in his life he had instructed many poor people as they were dying. But never had he seen in such a one such faith as in Emperor Nicholas I, which triumphed over the approaching death. Another eyewitness of the last hours of the life of the sovereign expressed the opinion that had an atheist been brought into the room of the Tsar then, he would have become a believer. After communion the sovereign pronounced the words, O Lord, accept me in peace. The Empress recited, Our Father. After the pronouncing of the Emperor's favorite words, Thy will be done, he said, Always, always. Several times he then repeated the prayer, Now lettest thy servant depart in peace, O Master, according to thy word. Then the sovereign gave all necessary instructions concerning his burial. He demanded that there be as little expense as possible for the funeral. He forbade that the hall be decked with black where his body would be, for this was not according to orthodox custom. He asked that there be placed in the coffin with him the icon of the Mother of God, Hodigitria, with which at his baptism the Empress Catherine had blessed him, that is, his grandmother Catherine II. He blessed his children and those who were absent. He blessed them from a distance. Grand Duchess Olgatha Nikolaevna, whom he loved so much, felt his paternal blessing at her place in Stuttgart. He called his nearest friends. To the heir to the throne he specially recommended Count Alderberg, saying, This counselor has been a close friend to me for forty years. Concerning Count Orloff, he said, You yourself know everything that needs to be done. I don't need to recommend anything to you. He gave thanks to the Empress's favorite maid, Madame Rohrberg, for her care of the Empress in the recent past. 
and in his bidding farewell to her, he said, Greet my dear Peterhoff for me. All the reports which came from the army he commanded to be given over to the Tsarovich. Then he asked that he be left alone for a while. Now, he said, I must be left alone so as to prepare myself for the final moment. I will call you when the time comes, he said. Later the emperor called certain of the grenadiers, bade farewell to them, asking them to give his final greeting to those who were not there. He asked the Tsarevich to give his greetings also to the guards, to the army, and especially to those who had been defending Sebastopol. Because he was dying at the very time when Russia was losing the Crimean War. Tell them that I will continue to pray for them in the other world. He commanded that final telegrams be sent to Sebastopol and to Moscow with these words. The emperor is dying and bids farewell to Moscow. At 8.20 his confessor, Father Boris, began to read the prayer of the departure of the soul from the body. The sovereign listened attentively to the words of these prayers, making the sign of the cross over himself from time to time. When the priest blessed him and gave him the cross to kiss, the dying sovereign said, I think that I never did evil in my life consciously. Notice how Francis says, I do not recognize any sin in myself. And he says, I think that I never consciously did evil. That is, he confessed all his sins and realizes he is full of sins, but he thinks that he never actually did evil consciously. He held the hand of the Empress in his and the Tsarevich also, and when he could no longer speak he bid farewell to them with a glance. At ten o'clock the Sovereign lost the capability of speaking. But before his repose he began to speak again. He commanded the Tsarevich to raise one of the princesses from her knees, since this was bad for her health. Some of his last words were, speaking to the Tsarevich, Hold on to everything, hold on to everything. Accompanying this with a decisive gesture. Then the agony began and the liturgy ended in the palace church. The wheezing before his death, wrote Tiucheva, kept getting stronger. His breathing became more and more difficult and sporadic. Finally, convulsions passed across his face and his head was thrown back. They thought that this was the end and already those around let out a cry of despair. But the emperor opened his eyes, raised them to heaven, smiled, and then it was all over. Seeing this death, so firm and so pious, one must think that the emperor had for a long time foreseen it and prepared himself for it. Archbishop Nicanor of Cherson, about the death of the emperor, said, His death was the image of the death of a Christian, for he was a man of repentance in full possession of his faculties and of unwavering manliness. In his testament he wrote, I die with a grateful heart for all the good things by which God has been pleased to reward me in this world which passes away, with ardent love for our glorious Russia, which I have served to my last to the best of my understanding with faith and righteousness. I regret that I could not do the good things which I so sincerely desired. My son will take my place. I shall entreat God that he will bless him for such a difficult work unto which he now enters, and will grant him to confirm Russia on the firm foundation of the fear of God. O oh, grant her, that is Russia, to come to fulfill its inward good order and he will push away all danger from without. In thee, O Lord, I have hoped. Let me not be ashamed unto the ages. Again he tells in his will to the Tsarevich, 
Keep strictly all that our church proscribes. You are young and inexperienced, and you are in those years when the passions are developing. But always remember that you must be an example of piety, and conduct yourself in such a way that by your life you might serve as a living example to the people. Be merciful and accessible to all the unfortunate ones, but do not spend money above the treasury. Very pious. Despise all kinds of slanders and rumors, but fear to go against your conscience. May the all-merciful God bless you. Place all your hope in him alone. He will not leave you as long as you will constantly turn to him. Tsar Nicholas Orthodox Tsar Anti-Revolution 200 He faithfully comprehended and precisely defined the triune origin of our historical existence, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. He strictly and consistently steered it in his personal politics, not only internal but external as well. He believed in Holy Russia, in calling her in the world. He labored for her benefit and stood untiring on the ground of her honor and dignity. The historian Tayuchev, in his notes, Russia and Revolution, wrote, At this opportunity, allow me to make the observation. In what way could it have happened that, among all the sovereigns of Europe, and equally among the political figures that guided her in recent times, only one could be found who, from the very beginning, recognized and proclaimed the great delusion of 1830, and who, from that time alone in Europe, and perhaps alone amongst all those around him, who constantly refused to yield to it. At that time, 1848, fortunately, there was a sovereign on the Russian throne in whom was embodied the Russian idea, and in the present world situation, it was the Russian idea alone that was so distinct from this revolutionary environment, and which could evaluate the facts that manifested themselves in it. Had Nicholas died in 1850, he would not have lived until the disastrous war with France and England which cut short his life and cast a gloomy shadow over his reign. But this shadow exists only for contemporaries. In the light of dispassionate history, it vanishes, and Nicholas stands in the ranks of the most celebrated and valiant kings in history. Helped Austria Without Reward, 201 in his thoughts and recollections, Prince Otto Bismarck says, In the history of European states, one can barely find another example of a monarch of such great power showing a neighboring state favor like that which Emperor Nicholas showed to Austria. Seeing the dangerous situation in which she found herself in 1849, he came to her aid with 150,000 troops, suppressed Hungary, re-established the king's power, and recalled his troops, without demanding for this from Austria any kind of concessions, any kind of compensation, and without even touching upon the disputed Eastern or Polish questions. In Hungary and in Olmutz, Emperor Nicholas acted with the conviction that he, as a representative of the monarchist principle, was called by fate to declare war on the revolution, which approached from the West. He was an idealist and remained faithful to himself in all historical moments. Idealist, 202. The famous general A. O. Diugamel wrote, the throne had never yet been occupied by a more noble knight, by a more honorable man. He never consented to any trace whatsoever of the revolution, 
and even liberalism aroused his suspicion. In his capacity as the autocrat of all Russia, Emperor Nicholas came early to the conviction that there was no other salvation for the empire than a union with conservative principles, and in the course of his thirty-year reign he never deviated from his preordained path. Recognized Louis Philippe, 203. Confirmation of what has been said may be found in the sovereign's relationship to the July Revolution of 1830 in France, and to the seizure of the throne by King Louis Philippe of Orléans in violation of the lawful rights of the grandson of King Carl X. The emperor for a long time did not agree to recognize him, despite the arguments of the ambassador in France, Count Bazo de Borbro. Finally, to the arguments of the latter were joined those of the Minister of Internal Affairs, Count Nesselrode, who presented the Tsar with a corresponding report. On it, the resolution was placed by the Sovereign. I know not which is more to be preferred, a republic or a similar so-called monarchy. Then he added, I surrender to your arguments, but I call heaven to witness that this is, and always will be, against my conscience, and that this is the most painful effort I have ever made. B. Golgov, Andreev 135, 6, 7, and 158 through 59. We are in possession of a treasure which cannot be valued. He thus characterizes the church and continues. This church, which, like a chaste virgin, is the only one that has preserved itself from the time of the apostles in its innocent original purity. This church, complete with its profound dogmas and most minute external rituals, was, as it were, brought down from heaven for the Russian people, which alone has the power to resolve all the intricacies of our perplexities and questions. And this church, which was created for life, we, even up to now, have not brought into our life. Golgol loudly and with conviction declared that the truth is in orthodoxy and in the orthodox Russian autocracy, that the historical to be or not to be is resolved by orthodox Russian culture, and that the immediate fate of the whole world depends on its preservation. The world is at the point of death and we are entering the pre-apocalyptic period of world history. Having been made indignant by the fact that Gogol dared to see the salvation of Russia in religio-mystical inward activities, in ascetic podvigs and prayer, and that he therefore considered the work of preaching to be higher than all the works, Belinsky, in this connection, wrote in his letter, Russia sees salvation neither in mysticism, nor in asceticism, nor in pietism, but in the success of civilization, enlightenment, and humanity. She needs neither sermons, she has heard enough of them, nor prayers. She has had enough of their endless repetitions, but the awakening in her people of a sense of human worth. This concludes the reading of Part 1 of Lecture 8 of Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Podmashensky. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and also be sure to click the notification bell to be notified of when I post new videos or do live streams. And check out my social media in the description. Thank you and God bless.